Hello, hello, and welcome to the Excuse Buster Show, where we bust through what gets in your way of feeling how you want to feel and living the life you want to live. I'm Lizzie Williamson, and if addiction is something that is holding you back, then you want to tune into this episode because my guest today, I'll oh, wait until you hear this woman talk. She is on a mission because of her own personal experience with addiction over a decade. She is a mom of six. She runs the Hope Project and is also has developed this system that really helps take away the shame, the, fear, the failure, all of those things that we've kind of got it wrong when she talks about that in Awake, where she delivers workshops. She's also a speaker. She's done a TEDx talk. I could go on and on, but I'm going to introduce the amazing Kate Seselja. Oh, thank you, Lizzie. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming over up to the Northern Beaches. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful day. Mm. When people meet you and they know what it is that, that you do and that you're all about, what do you hear them say to you the most? That I'm brave. Mm. And that to me, I just balk at it every time. And I say to them, no, we have to be able to communicate authentically or else we just stay hidden and are operating at surface level rather than actually exploring depth within ourselves or depth within other people. Because mm, you had quite a awakening, I suppose. There was a night where your son had a nightmare. Can you mm. share with us that story? Oh my gosh. He is so gorgeous, my son. And he was just about three nights in a row, woke up crying being upset about having a nightmare about dinosaurs mm. and here's Asperger's so he's very literal and and I thought I've got to come at this another way and I said to him do you know what I think your body was trying to tell you something what did you need to do when you woke up and he said go to the toilet and I said yes that's right it wasn't about the dinosaurs your body was just waking you up mm. and it was using the scariest thing that you had available in your memory bank to do that oh goosebumps <laughs> you just had one of those mum moments so you nailed it <laughs> but then i got back in bed and i was like oh my gosh my addiction was my body trying to wake me up mm. from the nightmare i was living in of unsustainable living you know not connected to me not connected to the truth of what was happening in my environment i didn't understand any depth of myself at that point and i didn't understand this product that i was engaging with which was poker machines mm. um, when you restore the knowledge of yourself when you restore and have an understanding of how in a product's been intentionally designed to addict then you can forgive yourself for information that you never possessed. Mm. And likewise with my son, you know, he, you know, he doesn't even think twice about whatever's happened to, to wake him up. Mm. He just gets on with what his body is telling him to do. Mm. And it was so beautiful the other morning, my youngest woke up and she came out and she said, Mom, I've had a scary dream. And he yells from across the room, Zoe, you just needed to go to the toilet. <laughs> That's fantastic. And it, it, it takes that, that fear, that um, anxiety away of what's wrong with me mm. and fires up your brain to start looking for what don't I know about me? What don't I know about the environment I'm trying to exist in? Mm. And that's a, a, an angle that I think is never, ever discussed when talking about addiction or struggle of any kind we focus, we zero in on the person and go, you know, you're different from others. What's wrong with you? Mm. Why can't you control what's happening? Mm. Um, and there's not a lot of compassion. There's mostly judgment. You had an interesting experience when you called up for some help, mm. <laughs> some, um, some interesting advice. Yes. Um, 20 years ago, there was not really much um, awareness of, of how powerful gambling addiction is. And Just how bad, by the way, was your gambling addiction? Oh, it, it very quickly hijacked my mind mm. from age 18 to mm. 32. Mm. 
um, it just haunted my memories, my dreams. I would hear the sounds of them. I would feel anxious every time a bill arrived. Um, you know, how how am I going to do this? Mm -hmm. How am I going to pay? You know, that that fear um, drove me time and time again to make more and more desperate attempts to resolve it unsuccessfully mm. and that yeah so I was told just don't wear shoes if you don't wear shoes you won't be able to get into a venue so you won't be able to gamble mm. and my heart just sank I, I didn't know what what was happening to me um, I'd never known anybody who'd struggled with it mm. so there was no modeling to learn from there was nobody talking about it but i would see people in the clubs just sitting there you know feeding money in like i was and no one did anything mm -hmm. no one had any words it was just an existence it really i wasn't living i can tell you mm -hmm. um and that shame attached to because here's the other thing, people don't know. You can lose over $1,200 an hour mm. on a poker machine. That's how they're designed to take your money so quickly. Um, that that happens so effortlessly that then all of a sudden you're like, uh, what just happened? How, how did, you know, mm. how did I lose so much so quickly? And shame is involved, so that drives behaviour, mm. um, fear, regret, all of that. And when we focus on that instead of the gaps in our well-being mm. and how to restore it, then we, we stay stuck over here. And so straight away now, you know, when people reach out to me, I try and help them see the areas in their life where they've lost, you know, their oxygen slipped off. Mm. Um, Self-care, self-awareness and self-esteem make up our oxygen mask that keeps us sustainable. And we, we haven't been taught that. We haven't mm. been spoken to um, about this kind of thing in that context. You know, mm. I bet you learnt about self-esteem in high school, mm. but was it given weight? Or was it just something that was... I can't even remember mentioned. learning about self-esteem. Maybe there was something in there um, when we did the sex education, yeah. you know, a little sprinkle of yeah. self-esteem. Mm. Well, you know, the first clue I had into realising that I had none was um, the counsellor the morning after I almost took my life. And she said, you know, I want you to tell me what you like about you. Mm. And that was... The most confronting question there was nothing that i liked about myself at that point i had separated from who the truth of who i was so far back that i couldn't even remember who i was mm. and so restoring that um trying to remember things you know, they didn't come to me immediately, but I, what I drew on was compliments that people had paid me. Mm. And I thought, maybe they they could see me and I, when I couldn't. Mm. And so they became the 10 things that I liked about myself and, you know, just slowly rebuilding self-care. I had no idea how mm. important that was to human sustainability. So I thought, okay, I'm a busy mum. How do I guarantee time for me so that I can serve my family? 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. became my time mm. to, to just fill myself up first and then be able to, you know, greet my kids as they rose up mm. out of bed. Um, you know, not depleted, not... Um, you know, dragging one foot after the other, but kind of awake and alert mm. and ready for them. So going back, I guess that between between that that moment when you were there, feeling like you couldn't go on, 
to going to the council the next mm. day like how how did that happen because it can so go either way I was pregnant mm. with our sixth child so she stopped me from taking my life that night um, I didn't have anything left at that stage and mental exhaustion physical exhaustion emotional financial mm. ruin mm. and being able to put words together was horrific mm. you know now i can understand because of the work i've done that trauma and silence are hand in hand mm -hmm. and so my husband had rung about a hundred times trying to find me and I eventually picked up. And where were you? At the club. Mm. And he said, please just come home. And I, I, I still had no words, mm -hmm. but I thought I have to, I have to try. I don't know what's going to happen, but I have to try. And he just pleaded with me to go and see a new counsellor the next day, and I did. And that just started this path of connection back to me, mm. connection back into the community. And that started by me opening up to friends that I hadn't told about because then Monday night became the night where I'd go to a group. Mm. And so if I got an invitation to go somewhere on a Monday night, I would take that as an opportunity to go, do you know what? This is where I'm going and this is why. And so that just started these conversations of, you know, that just grew into me being completely comfortable about telling anyone about mm. what had happened and I realized that in not connecting to that part of myself pretending like it didn't happen or it didn't exist was only holding me back mm. and in being vulnerable it provided that pathway for other people to connect with their struggle mm without even having to give any conscious thought to it because mm. as soon as you lead with your own vulnerability that your heart opens and a pathway just happens and so i knew that that needed to keep happening mm. and so i two years down the track i trained and i, I took over that recovery group and but i was sitting there on a monday night waiting for people to come who'd already imploded their life mm. and I thought no I can do more I've got to be meeting people where they're at not waiting for them to identify because often when a person finally admits to it or, or gets to a place where they reach out for help it's so long down the track mm. and so much damage so has much been done. damage mm. has been done and the system of awake that, you know, I want it to be a daily part of your life to recognize that when your emotions rise up in some way, shape or form, it's trying to tell you something. Mm. There's something you need to learn about you or there's something you need to learn about somebody else. But right now we kind of jump to judgment mm. or we jump to shame, we jump to fear, we jump to, you know, whatever that is, instead of going, hold on a minute, that person just said something what do I need to know about me why did I react that way mm. how can I you know be more compassionate of uh, trying to understand their pain their struggle what's led them to out, have an outburst mm. or the behavior that I'm experiencing and you know likewise looking at how children act mm. it's Behaviour is communication. So... Oh, that's... <laughs> Behaviour is communication. That's amazing. If I was Oprah, I'd say that's a tweetable <laughs> moment. <laughs> we have to pay...
pay attention mm. to what our behavior is expressing mm. and think about you just mentioned you know as in this community in every community there are clear visible signs of distress mm. and the fact that it isn't going away means that we're not actually dealing with it mm. and you only have to look back maybe one generation to at most and you'll see that there was this attitude of just sweep it under the rug oh yeah just mm. pretend like it didn't happen mm -hmm. now things left unprocessed by the mind they just don't go away mm. they manifest they transfer so we have to pay attention to what our mind our bodies need us to deal with and let go deal with and learn or deal with and live with mm. um, and right now we're not doing any of it we're just pretending like it's not happening and medicating our way through in whatever shape or form that takes in your life mm. and that's not sustainable mm. it isn't um, so for me you know I, I kind of came to the very precipice of the end of my pain and then I reverse engineered what I did to kind of stay alive mm -hmm. and actually start to thrive but then I went back way upstream to figure out what is happening that this keeps you know occurring mm -hmm. in our society where we have access to resources and information mm -hmm. and technology and you know we've gone light years in one extreme but we're going backwards yeah. internally um, as human beings we're not thriving we're not we're existing mm -hmm. and there's varying degrees of existing mm. uh, there's really high functioning existing and that's when I'm called in to, you know, speak to executives who are, you know, producing great numbers, but they're imploding mm. in personally. Mm. Relationship breaks down, um, you know, suicide rates, addiction rates, mental health rates. They're just um, clear evidence that we're not getting being human right. Mm. And until we get that right, then we won't see shifts in the other things, the other outcomes of human pain that we're not effectively dealing with. Mm. So, um, you know, it was the reason why I linked up with uh, the UN because of the Sustainable Development Goals. We need to make massive shifts for our planet to survive. Mm. And they need to be made by 2030 and we won't achieve them unless human beings rise up wake up connect and be okay with being human mm. um, that is something that is really you know because we can go oh we need to stop all this rubbish well that's a byproduct of um you know convenience mm because we're mindlessly doing so much that we just consume, consume, consume mm. um, in the most convenient way rather than do it mindfully, intentionally, um, nourish our bodies. There, there's just, you know it, mm -hmm. you know, there, there's gaps in, yeah. in all of that space. People are so addicted to coffee. That is a clear, indicator that you're not getting enough sleep mm. where where's your sleep hygiene at mm. you know um domestic violence well that's another uh, it's behavior mm. there is an unmet need in that environment that isn't properly expressed or communicated then shame takes hold and it escalates the issue further mm. There's lots of things that we're not addressing, but there are really powerful 
movements and bodies of knowledge and new science that backs up everything I'm saying. Mm. Um, the work of Johan Hari, you know, I don't know if you've seen his incredible TED talk no. of the opposite of addiction is connection. No. Um, he talks about societal connection and how no. when we exclude people, um, you know, we just create more of the same and and I 100% agree with um, what he's saying, you know, we need to create more connected spaces for people to be um, not excluded for being human. Mm, so rather than when you were, you know, were there in that, you know, in that height of your addiction, rather than sort of everyone looking at you going, oh gosh, that, you know, yeah. that, that woman, look what she's doing. Yeah. What do we need to do in, instead to that person, for that person? Go, it's okay, mm -hmm. you're just not awake at the moment. Mm. There's been really harmful impacts to your well-being. Let's find out where they are mm. and help restore them. Mm. Isn't that a better conversation than what's wrong with you? In the judgment. You're, mm. you're a letdown to the family, you're a disgrace, why can't you be in control of your behaviour? All of that, mm. you know, and that in itself is a behaviour which is expressing the pain felt by the family, mm. which they are 100% entitled to. But it's the way that we need to communicate to others. We need to kind of step out of our own pain to see another person's. Mm. So, you know, I've had some really powerful moments with families who have tried to figure out how to talk to their loved one. Mm. Because the tough love thing doesn't work. Mm. It just creates, it just piles on shame when the person's already below sea level. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's real, and as I said, it's really, really hard when you are entitled to the pain that you feel. And it comes back to, you know, another thing I say to my Jonah, you know, he's very passionate. I say to him, it's okay to feel angry about stuff, but you can't act angry. Mm. You have to figure out what it's telling you and then act intentionally. Do you mind if I steal that yeah. for my youngest? <laughs> <laughs> because you can't say don't feel angry because no. that's like mm. so unhelpful. Yes. But it's what is that anger trying to tell you it's mm. getting them to think about it rather than react so um, so what would that anger be trying to tell them do you think that they need to have some more patience or mm. that something unjust might have happened but it's not your job to you know judge another person's you know yeah. like to say somebody does something wrong on the soccer field mm. it's not jonah's job to be the referee mm. you know he has to go okay they they did something wrong they're human you mm. know mm. but that um you can feel like it's unjust that's perfectly fine for you to feel like that was a bad call mm. but it's not okay for you to yell at the ref and say you know you got it wrong mm. because the ref is human just as you are. Mm, so that's you that, that empathy, that, yes. yeah, I love that, that idea of stepping out of your pain and seeing See. it from there. So then on the other side, mm. when you've got um, how you're wanting, you know, how much more impactful is when your family or friends speak to you, mm. I guess the thing is that you often don't speak out yourself and it's the secrecy, the mm. shame, the fear, not just gambling, there's a oh. you know, <laughs> list, yeah. of, list of things. So trying to find, I guess, some, some steps, some ways to, to move forward from, mm. from that shame. Yes. Mm. And it, it comes back to self-forgiveness mm. because we have to start from this level of I didn't understand the depth of me you know who can stand there right now and say that they're hundred percent rock solid in themselves mm. their own self-knowledge you know Socrates has an incredible um, piece of information 
that he had two and a half thousand years ago, he said, people make themselves appear ridiculous when they try to know obscure things before they know themselves. Mm. Think about how many years we spend at school or university learning other things and not about ourselves. So, you know, everyone on that basis alone can forgive themselves for it's not so having that self-knowledge yet. It's meant to be built. We're not born fully formed adults for a reason because it's a growth journey. It's not, you know, we've got to just stop flogging ourselves for stuff mm. we didn't know and start being more compassionate and curious to know more. I remember a big turning point for me uh, starting to share my journey about mm. when I was postnatal depression, so much shame. Mm. How dare I feel like this with all that I had, healthy babies, everything. Mm. And a big, I remember I was running one day this must have been about seven years ago or something and just in my head the shame the shame the regret the regret and I just remember stopping going that's enough it is time to forgive yourself mm. and that was such the tipping point mm. I think when I decided to start the journey to forgiving myself yes mm. yes it is it is absolutely the the pivot moment where I stopped blaming myself and started to really operate free of that shame was it a practice that you did was it a decision you made what did it look like in a practical sense i think it was that gradual sort of um being curious about mm. all that was going on and that happened um in that group setting of we had to bring the parameters of our life back into just the last seven days. Mm -hmm. So we could only talk about what had happened between, you know, the last Monday. And so we could kind of have this little bit of a, all right, I, I'm, I might need to problem solve something that's happening in the next week. Or we'd have a story of this happened and I, I did this instead of in the past I would have gone bang you know mm. straight back to the club so it, it it was just that moments of little individual sort of light bulbs going on and growing in that knowledge and being grateful that now I was able to um, have this this calm this peace about me to um, think my way through whatever was impacting me rather than just be continuously in reaction mode mm. um, so I think if there's one thing there is no magic pill there is no quick fix mm -hmm. but we have to be curious mm. and everyone can do that um, and look for what you look for an angle you haven't seen yet mm. you know look at step out of it what observe, was your angle you hadn't seen observe yet? Observe your life. Well, it was funny, you know, I, I kind of said to her, well, you know, I've just had this happen. This to the yeah, counsellor. This is to yeah. the counsellor, you know, I built a home, run our own business, got children, rah, rah, rah. And she just said to me, you know, any one of those things is a lot of stress mm. on a human being. And you have all of this going on at the same time. You know that's that's big, mm. and and you 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 managed the best way you knew how at the time. Mm. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I hadn't seen it like that. All I was seeing my life was through the lens of failing at every step. Mm. It was just completely um, looking at everything through a negative lens. Mm. And so when you do that, you rob yourself of everything you're actually doing right. Mm. And that connection back to that 10 things that I liked about myself was that really starting to believe that truth of who I was mm. and you know that I was, I was worthy. I, I did I hadn't excluded myself from being whole mm. 
Did you did you look at that all the time? What did you do with that? Yeah, all the time. Mm. Where was it? In my wallet. Uh -huh. mm, nice. Just mm. to remind me. Um, and I just started doing little practices of my own kind of accountability. So if I said, um, you know, that I was going out to have a coffee with a friend, I would ring my husband from the the coffee shop and say you know do you want to talk to this person just he didn't ask me to do that mm. but i wanted to try and take proactive steps to repair that trust mm -hmm. um you know likewise he's done similar things with me um that that made sense to him to show that we're trying to restore that um elements of, of damage that occur when human beings you know mm. fall down mm. and it doesn't mean that we can never be okay again uh, I thought that identifying as, as having a struggle meant that I was no longer going to be okay or a good enough mother or a good enough wife or a good enough daughter anymore mm -hmm. and I was afraid of that I was afraid of what it was going to cost me mm -hmm. so that kept fueling that behavior but letting people in uh, and seeing how um, you know the vast majority of people that did care about me mm. were desperately sad that they hadn't been aware of everything that had been impacting me mm. um, was overwhelming that mm. you know I and then I had to look at it from the level of being a mum and I tried to shelter my children from my struggle because I thought you know, if they know this about me they're going to be ashamed but it's been I had this moment if I don't model how to overcome struggles where are they going to learn it? So true isn't it? Yeah. We're so programmed to put out this image of ourselves is something that um this almost the perfection mm. something we, we're all good we've got it all together yeah. otherwise what do we think that people will think i don't know that they don't like us anymore yes. they don't want to hang out with us anymore yes mm. and so you know i i've talked in my kids schools of mm. um i was the chair of, of <laughs> for three years and and I said to them that was just a, before I went public actually and I said you know would you oh, I'm happy to resign if if that is going to cause any issue whatsoever but there was this resounding no gosh we need more of this you know mm. attitude and it just constantly messages from people you know wow you help me think about my life differently you help me relate to my sister better you help me understand my mother my father whatever it is um whatever struggle looks like in your family try and see it through a different lens try and see that human that has their well-being ripped to shreds mm. help them repair it help them restore it don't judge them for it mm. and don't put a label on it we're all human, full stop. That's the only label we should ever have. Mm. There's none that makes sense on any level other than that. Mm. And so, you know, it's, I guess my stuff is simple. It's, it's basic, but it's kind of the fundamentals that we've lost sight of or thought they were irrelevant or I don't know. Mm. But in not framing our world in, is what I'm doing right now sustainable? Mm. Am I mentally sustainable? 
in where I'm working, in the relationship I'm in, in um, you know, the way I'm speaking to myself in my own head, mm. in the way I'm portraying myself on social media, all of it, if I'm not sustainable, it's going to end badly. Mm. Yeah. And, and I think giving people that um, ability to, you know, take the, the two minutes to do things, um, it, it really makes it sustainable it makes it attainable mm -hmm. for people to incorporate into their life mm -hmm. so you know I guess I want to challenge your audience to take two minutes to think about their mental sustainability mm -hmm. and I'm sure once they start doing it it will grow mm -hmm. but the last thing I want to do is overwhelm people who are in an overwhelmed state mm -hmm. so just spending two minutes with yourself and being reflective is so nourishing. It's like the equivalent to so much water a day mm. and so many hours of sleep. It, you know, if you give yourself that mental rest, how clear, how much more clearer can you see your world through rested mind? So I guess in that mind and that taking that two minutes, it can be easy when you look at your mental state to just that that critic that judging voice mm. to to come on in so what does that actually when you take those couple of minutes to check in with how you are if you're mentally sustainable mm. what does that what does that look like are you trying to quiet your mind are you just noticing things are you talking to yourself I think it's great to have that um, have a journal nearby because mm. when things do pop into your mind the way that we do processing is putting words to it mm. so that's another reason why communication authentic communication is so vital um, we need to be able to articulate what our mind is trying to kind of express to us mm. and take notice of so yeah, the act of journaling is very powerful. Curiosity, curiosity you're saying, yes. you're curious about what's coming yeah. in. Mm. Um, and noticing how you're speaking to yourself. Mm. Um, Becoming awake. Mm. And it's just little moments at a time. Mm. And then when things happen and, you know, because we can't, I, I'm not selling rainbows and sunshine and, and, you know, that it's going to be easy. I don't know where we, we got in our heads that life is meant to be easy. Mm. We cannot control what happens, but we can control how we act. Mm. And that's the, the big shift is you can't um, make yourself free of, of never having to feel anything ever again. It's having that mental buffer zone to be calm enough to know how to work and move through it mm. and not be in a, con you know, a continuous state of overwhelm reaction, overwhelm reaction, overall reaction. Mm. Look at politics. That's a perfect example mm. of people reacting all the time it's mm. reactive it's mm. not intentional and that I think is um, you know a clear view of how we we can be able to move through the world more successfully and more sustainably if we are making sure that we have our well-being intact mm. that we're breathing clear fresh oxygen mm. and able to navigate a better path mm. and that authentic communication mm. the thing that has surprised me the most in my journey since starting to you know share my story and all of those things is that by the sharing of my story of what really happened mm. the you know the ugly stuff mm. 
that has been the moments where I know that I have been able to help someone mm. the most. Mm. And I always thought how I could help someone the most is by looking at, I've got it all together. Yeah. I can just, you know, just do this and this. <laughs> uh, but I just realized what helped me the most is when I am vulnerable, it takes that shame away yes. for someone else it and allows them to be vulnerable. Yes. Mm. It, it's an invisible bridge. Mm. More of that. Yeah. We more need of that. Mm. More bridges. Yes. To connection. Yeah. And yeah, you, you, and but the whole process of you actually articulating your journey would would have been transformative for you. Absolutely. Um, mm. In having to put words to how you were feeling, you mm. had to reflect and express it. And mm. you know, I think that we're just not used to actually reflecting mm -hmm. and one of the the pictures on my instagram is is this you know the reflection of um you know trees in water you can only see them clearly if it's still mm. nice it's stillness <laughs> mm. that's the key to getting clarity in your reflection mm. If you are rushing past or the wind is moving, it, the water looks distorted. Mm. So how, how are you meant to see your life clearly if you're never actually stopping to give any thought to reflection? Mm. Um, and that, I think, is, is really key in just spending a, a moment to think about the encounters that you've had during the day and what you know, has what has made you react? What is that trying to tell you? Mm. Is it is it pointing out? You know, have you your patience has run out? It's a clear indicator that you're not self caring enough. Yes, absolutely. You know, mm. if, if somebody says something that's injuring your self esteem, then how grounded are you in it? Mm. Have they said something that's challenged your beliefs? Do, do you get firmer in that belief or do you be curious to understand what's driving their beliefs mm. and growing in self-awareness so you know just adding to that that resilience pile that wealth of information that we're meant to keep growing and learning through that's how you build your self-awareness it's not a one-time mm -hmm. I tick that box mm -hmm, yeah. I'm self-aware now no it's a growing process yeah so that you can be more reflective be more understanding be more compassionate uh, tolerant all of those things that we are meant to be um, you know so many people would just get absolutely pounced upon in our culture for expressing a belief or a, a, a viewpoint mm that isn't popular mm. and it instead of it you know we, we sh we're not all supposed to be the same mm. we're unique by design mm. so we shouldn't have a problem with somebody else having a different set of beliefs mm. it shouldn't even be an issue it just oh, it drives me mental but that we don't have tolerance mm. we don't have compassion and that um, fuels this behavior mm. that we see. Yeah. People are afraid to be who they really are. Mm -hmm. And coming back to how that's the thing that people say to you, so brave. Because I guess a lot of people are quite worried about what the reaction mm. is going to be. Mm. I think I've had permanent goosebumps <laughs> this whole conversation. <laughs> and I feel like we could sort of sit on this couch for hours. You just, just keep on coming out with all this amazing wisdom. I really want to thank you so much for, for all that you do. And I asked you this question before we started because I would imagine anyone who's heard you say that you have six children might be thinking the same. How do you have six children and still be on this, this mission and be doing all these things, working with the UN, getting up on the TEDx stage, doing these workshops, speaking, running all these things? 
I put my kids' stuff into my diary first. Okay. Then I try and just do it as it fits into my life. Mm. And I want there to be a better world for them to grow up in. Mm. And right now it's not cutting it. It's nowhere near cutting it. And I'm really... I felt for the longest time that, you know, I didn't fit in in the world, that I, you know, it just didn't make sense on any level. And now I feel like I have a, a grip on an understanding um, that has been born from my struggle. And I think when I see people who have taken that next step that I didn't, mm my heart breaks so deeply for them because I see it as failed awakenings mm. that they were almost mm. able to connect back to themselves but the world got in the way mm. and broke their spirit broke their light and I want to make sure that people connect back to their light back to the truth and not be led and reactive, but be calm and intentional and, you know, have space for another person's pain mm. because you're not continually drowning in your own. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so very, very much. <laughs> it's been an amazing conversation. And the, all the links to the Hope Project will be up there and anything else that you want to share in terms of people can get more information about what you're doing with um, well I have a, a documentary that I brought out from the US it's mm. called resilience the biology of stress and the science of hope and it really helps create that environment to begin these conversations in communities um, I was just at Belconnen Community Services last night and, you know, teachers, emergency workers, community sector workers, it's, it's information for everybody mm. um, that if we don't understand um, the impact of adversity on our physical and mental health, then we can't move forward from it. Mm. And it speaks into that, um, you know, we're being so afraid of being really real mm -hmm. um, and that's that's what's happening so um, that documentary I do screenings um, yeah in a community setting or in schools workplaces universities in trying to unleash this broader conversation to build resilient communities mm. build sustainable human beings mm -hmm. um, so that we can actually look at all these outcomes of pain violence addiction mental health struggles in the proper context. Mm. Oh, then I can't wait to see it. <laughs> can't wait to see it. Yeah. The other thing that we should mention, if you are experiencing any sort of feelings, needing any kind of help, addiction, we've mentioned also postnatal depression, mm -hmm. and give Lifeline a call and that number will be up there. And also PANDA, Perinatal Anxiety Depression Australia, is someone else you can contact as well. Mm -hmm. But definitely going to seek help from your GP is a good place to start as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. And calling up. And I guess if you do call someone and don't quite get the advice that you're after, try another way. Yes. There's always um, somebody who will hear you and listen to you mm -hmm. and, you know, keep looking for that person um you know many people connect with me and i just kind of help guide them to whatever um service is m most appropriate for them mm. um yeah it it's basically trying to help <laughs> properly frame human sustainability but i also kind of end up as a conduit for um people accessing help mm -hmm. and uh, but yeah you know don't lose sight of who you are mm. um, and try and pay attention to what your mind and body is trying to 
tell you about the unsustainable environment that you're existing in. Yes, and become go that jet the journey to becoming awake. Mm. Mm. Yes. Thank you so much. You are an extraordinary woman. Woman, we've been very, very lucky to have you here. So thank you very, very much. If there is something that you really resonated with you from this conversation, then feel free to keep the conversation going in the comments. Let us know what's resonated, what you feel you maybe want to take action on in there or feel free to message us privately as well for any this episode and future episodes the excuse buster show just head to two minute moves.com forward slash live tv pop in your deets there and it'll be in your inbox massive thank you to lorna jean for <laughs> my outfit so comfy and and a big thank you to you for being here for watching and for taking the time for yourself and for your own well-being to listen to conversations like this one where you can find out those little things that you can do in your day like taking the two minutes to become aware of what's going on in your mind there a bit of journaling a bit of curiosity because those little things really do add up to make a big difference as you can see from this mm. amazing woman next to me here what's happened though all those little steps mm. has led you to what you are doing now and what an impact you are making on the world your community and also i'm sure your six beautiful children so thank you very much thank you <laughs> we'll see you for another episode very soon Bye-bye.